It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. For today's episode of Comparative Mythology, we're going to compare and contrast elements of the book of Genesis to Greek mythology. So the question then becomes, what exactly is my justification to compare Greek mythology to the book of Genesis? My main justification to compare and contrast Greek mythology to the book of Genesis largely comes directly from the World History Encyclopedia about Phoenicia. The Phoenicians were primarily known as sailors who had developed a high skill in shipbuilding and were able to navigate the often turbulent waters of the Mesopotamian Sea. Shipbuilding seemed to be perfected at Bablos where the design of the curved hurl was initiated. However, Phoenician sailors were also have traveled to Britain and to Mesopotamian ports. Evidence gathered from Phoenician shipwreck provide modern day archaeologists with first hand evidence of some of the cargoes these ships carried. It is also thought that many of the gods of ancient Greece were imported from Phoenicia as there were certain indisputable similarities in some stories concerning the Phoenician gods Baal and Yam and the great deities of Zeus and Poseidon. It is also noticeable that the battle between the Christian god and Satan, as related in the book of Revelation, seem a much later version of the same conflict with the many same details one finds in the Phoenician myth of Baal and Yam. In 332 BCE, Alexander the Great conquered Baalbek, renaming it Helipopolis, and marched upon the subdued cities of Byblos and Sidon the same year. Upon his arrival at Tyre, the citizens followed the example set by Sidon and submitted peacefully to Alexander's demand for submission. The religious beliefs of the Tyrians forbid foreigners from sacrificing or even attending services in the temple and so they offered Alexander a compromise whereby they could offer sacrifice in the old city on the mainland, but not in the temple on the island complex of Tyre. Alexander found this proposal unacceptable and sent envoys to Tyre demanding their surrender. The Tyrian killed the envoys and strewed their bodies over the walls. At this point, Alexander ordered a slage of Tyre and was determined to take the city, that he built a castleway from the ruins of the old city, debris, and trees from the mainland to the island, first owing the deposit over the century, which is why Tyre is not an island today, and after seven months, bleached the wall and massacred most of the populace. By 64 BCE, the dissembled parts of Phoenicia were acquired by Rome, and by 15 CE were the colonies of the Roman Empire, with Heliopolis remaining an important site based upon the greatest religious building, the Temple of Jupiter Baal, and all the empire, the ruins of which well preserved to this day. The most famous legacy of Phoenicia is undoubtedly the alphabet, but also their contribution to the arts and their role in dissembling the culture of the ancient world. So based upon this historical information, it's safe to say that not only the ancient Canaan or Phoenicia was getting ideas directly from Mesopotamia, but also it seems as though that they were also getting ideas directly from the Greeks because they were actually being conquered by Alexander the Great, and it seems as though that the gods of Phoenicia, like El, Baal, and Ashura, directly inspired the creation of gods like Zeus or Poseidon. So what exactly are the connections between the book of Genesis as well as the Greek mythology. Yahweh, the God of the Bible, instructs both Adam and Eve to not eat directly from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And during the encounter, the snake in the garden tricked Eve to get in the fruit directly from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And she in return gave the fruit to Adam. And it happens that after they got the fruit in their stomachs, they began to notice that they were naked. And as soon as they were noticed that they were naked, the God of the Bible has punished humanity, which started the fall of man. According to Hasiod's work in days, Zeus told Prometheus not to give humanity the fire to have knowledge about things, and Prometheus decided to give humanity the fire, 
and because Zeus learned that Prometheus gave humanity the fire, he decided to torture Prometheus by singing like an eagle against him, and Hercules at the very last minute during the last days decided to rescue Prometheus. There was a woman named Pandora, and one day Pandora decided to open a jar that was full of bad things, and the only things that was left in the jar was that of hope. So all the stuff like plagues, disease, illnesses came directly from the jar onto humanity. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee? that thou wast naked. Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins, and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. But Zeus, in the anger of his heart, hid it away, because the devious-minded Prometheus had cheated him. And therefore Zeus thought up dismal sorrows for mankind. He hid fire, but Prometheus, the powerful son of Iapetus, stole it again from Zeus of the councils to give to mortals. He hid it out of the sight of Zeus, who delights in thunder in the hollow fennel stalk. In anger the cloud-gatherer spoke to him. Son of Iapetus, 
deviser of crafts beyond all others. You are happy that you stole the fire and outwitted my thinking. But it will be a great sorrow to you and to men who come after. As the price of fire, I will give them an evil, and all men shall fondle this, their evil, close to their hearts, and take delight in it. So spoke the father of gods and mortals, and laughed out loud. He told glorious Hephaestus to make haste and plaster earth with water, and to infuse it with a human voice and vigour, and make the face like the immortal goddesses, the bewitching features of a young girl. Meanwhile Athene was to teach her her skills, and how to do the intricate weaving, while Aphrodite was to mist her head in golden endearment, and the cruelty of desire and longings that wear out the body. But to Hermes, the guide, the slayer of Argus, he gave instructions to put in her the mind of a hussy and a treacherous nature. So Zeus spoke, and all obeyed Lord Zeus, the son of Cronus. The renowned strong smith modelled her figure of earth in the likeness of a decorous young girl, as the son of Cronus had wished it. The goddess grey-eyed Athene dressed and arrayed her. The graces, who are goddesses, and hallowed persuasion, put necklaces of gold upon her body, while the seasons, with glorious tresses, put upon her head a coronal of spring flowers, and Pallas Athene put all decor upon her body. But into her heart Hermes, the guide, the slayer of Argus, put lies and wheedling words of falsehood and a treacherous nature, made her as Zeus of the deep thunder wished. And he, the god's herald, put a voice inside her, and gave her the name of woman, Pandora, because all the gods who have their homes on Olympus had given her each a gift to be a sorrow to men who eat bread. Now, when he had done with this sheer impossible deception, the father sent the god's fleet messenger Hermes, to Epimetheus, bringing her a gift. Nor did Epimetheus remember to think how Prometheus had told him never to accept a gift from Olympian Zeus, but always to send it back, for fear it might prove to be an evil for mankind. He took the evil, and only perceived it when he possessed her. Since before this time the races of men had been living on earth free from all evils, free from laborious work, and free from all wearing sicknesses that bring their fates down on men, for men grow old suddenly in the midst of misfortune. But the woman, with her hands lifting away the lid from the great jar, scattered its contents, and her design was sad troubles for mankind. Hope was the only spirit that stayed there in the unbreakable closure of the jar, under its rim, and could not fly forth abroad, for the lid of the great jar closed down first and contained her. This was by the will of cloud-gathering Zeus of the Aegis. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that Hercules was the one that saved Prometheus. Now, according to the legends, he did at least 12 different labors. He, of course, fought against a lion, according to one of the legends. He fought against a hydra, according to one of the legends. And one of the stories for Hercules was the idea of actually getting apples from a tree. Heracles had performed these 10 labors in the space of eight years and one month. But Eurystheus, discounting the second and the fifth, set him two more. The eleventh labor was to fetch fruit from the golden apple tree, Mother Earth's wedding gift to Hera, with which she had been so delighted that she planted it in her own divine garden. This garden lay on the slopes of Mount Atlas, where the panting chariot horses of the sun complete their journey, and where Atlas's sheep and cattle 
one thousand herds of each, wander over their undisputed pastures. When Hera found, one day, that Atlas's daughters, the Hesperides, to whom she had entrusted the tree, were pilfering the apples, she set the ever-watchful dragon Laden to coil around the tree as its guardian. Some say that Laden was the offspring of Typhon and Echidne, others that he was the youngest born of Quito and Phorcys, others again that he was the Parthogenous son of Mother Earth. He had one hundred heads and spoke with diverse tongues. It is equally disputed whether the Hesperides lived on Mount Atlas in the land of the Hyperboreans, or on Mount Atlas in Mauritania, or somewhere beyond the ocean stream, or on two islands near the promontory called the Western Horn, which lies close to the Ethiopian Hesperii, on the borders of Africa. Though the apples were hearers, Atlas took a gardener's pride in them, and when Themis warned him, One day long hence, Titan, your tree shall be stripped of its gold by a son of Zeus. Atlas, who had not then been punished with his terrible task of supporting the celestial globe upon his shoulders, built solid walls around the orchard, and expelled all strangers from his land. It may well have been he who set Laden to guard the apples. Heracles, not knowing in what direction the garden of the Hesperides lay, marched through Illyria to the river Po, the home of the oracular sea god Nereus. On the way he crossed the Echidorus, a small Macedonian stream, where Sickness, the son of Ares and Pyrene, challenged him to a duel. Ares acted as Sickness's second, and marshalled the combatants, but Zeus hurled a thunderbolt between them, and they broke off the fight. When at last Heracles came to the Po, the river nymphs, daughters of Zeus and Themis, showed him Nereus asleep. He seized the hoary old sea god, and clinging to him despite his many protean changes, forced him to prophesy how the golden apples could be won. Some say, however, that Heracles went to Prometheus for this information. Nereus had advised Heracles not to pluck the apples himself, but to employ Atlas as his agent, meanwhile relieving him of his fantastic burden. Therefore, on arriving at the garden of the Hesperides, he asked Atlas to do him this favour. Atlas would have undertaken almost any task for the sake of an hour's respite, but he feared Ladon, whom Heracles thereupon killed with an arrow shot over the garden wall. Heracles now bent his back to receive the weight of the celestial globe, and Atlas walked away, returning presently with three apples plucked by his daughters. He found the sense of freedom delicious. I will take these apples to Eurystheus myself without fail, he said, if you hold up the heavens for a few months longer. Heracles pretended to agree, but, having been warned by Nereus not to accept any such offer, begged Atlas to support the globe for only one moment more while he put a pad on his head. Atlas, easily deceived, laid the apples on the ground and resumed his burden, whereupon Heracles picked them up and went away with an ironical farewell. But undoubtedly, the most famous story of the bunch happens to be Dicarion's Flood. Now, this particular version of the story comes directly from the library of Apollodorus, and Prometheus had a son, Dicarion, and when Zeus was restored to man the Bronze Age, Dicarion, by the advice of Prometheus, constructed a chest, and having it stored with provision, he embarked it with Phoenicia. But Zeus, by pouring heavy rain from the heaven, flooded the greater part of Greece so that all men were destroyed, except a few who fled to the high mountains in the neighborhood. Floating in the chest over the sea for nine days and as many nights, drafted to Panassus, and there, when the rain ceased, he lit it and sacrificed to Zeus, the god of escape, and Zeus sent Hermes to him and allowed him to choose what he would, and he chose to get men, and at the bidding of Zeus, he took up stones and strewed them over his heads, and the stone which they carry on became men, and the stones which they became women. Hence people were medically formally called Laos from Laos of stone, and Dicarion had children. According to Plato, he says right here, 
that many great deluges have taken place during the 9,000 years, for that is the number of years that have lapsed since the time of which I am speaking. And during all this time and throughout many changes, there has never been any considerable accumulation of the soil coming down from the mountains as in other places. But the earth has fallen away all round and sank of sight. The consequence is that in comparison of what then was, there was remaining only the bones of the waste bodies, as they would be called, as in the case of small islands, all the richer and smaller parts of the soil having fallen away, and the mere skeleton of the land being left. It can be dated back roughly around 1528 BC. Now keep in mind that the book of Genesis was not written down roughly until 1200 to 1400 BCE. Now this article comes directly from the National Center for Science Education. It says right here that Noah's Ark may have happened, but not the whole entire world. Now if we go down, we can see right here the regional evidence for similar floods during the time period of Noah's Ark. It says right here that two rivers, the Euphrates and Tigris River, flows through Mesopotamia, which is now the country of Iraq. There are several layers in exposed rocks near these two rivers in southeastern Mesopotamia, Iraq, that are likely flood deposits. Most are about, about 1 foot, about 0 0.3 meters thick, but one is as much as 3 meters thick, according to McDonald in 1988. Further debris from this same stick deposited along the Euphrates River near the ancient city of Sunapec, about 200 kilometers southeast of Baghdad, has been dated by the C-14 method, given an age about 2900 BCE, that the flood debris 2.4 meters feet stick are also reported by McDonnell as far northeast as the ancient Babylonian city of Kirsch, at any rate, the many flood deposit layers show that flooding in southern Mesopotamia was not unusual in ancient times. In other words, the flooding that was happening led to stories starting with the Ark Tablet. And from the Ark Tablet, we got the Epic of Adaharis. And from the Epic of Adaharis, we got Gilgamesh. And from there, we got the Carrion's Flood. And from there, we got the ideas of the Book of Genesis for Noah's in conclusion, the Old Testament is an entanglement of ideas directly from ancient Mesopotamia, from Zoroastrianism, from the ideas of Greek mythology and Greek philosophy, and the ideas of the Egyptians. So, what do you guys think? Tell me in the comment section down below, and as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't have <laughs> him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.